want to continue our discussion on miracles in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Mark as a whole. And you'll remember that in the first eight chapters, 14 out of the 18 miracles that Jesus performs occur. And they raise that question, who is this guy? Who is Jesus that he's able to do these miracles? And we saw with the feeding of the 5,000 that the miracles don't only raise that question, but they're also designed to help answer that question, that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Christ, and he is bringing God's kingdom, God's future rule into the present. Now, what I want us to do in this lecture is take a look at another miracle of Jesus. It's in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. And this may be the most confusing miracle of them all in the Gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. I'll go ahead and read it for us. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Okay, one more time. I mean, that's a confusing one. It took Jesus two times to bring healing to the guy. Listen to it again. And they came to Bethsaida, Jesus and his disciples did. And some people brought to Jesus a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when Jesus had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Now, this is confusing because Jesus spits in the guy's eyes, touches him, and then asks him, do you see anything? No other place does Jesus ask that type of a question to people that he's healed. He doesn't ask the paralytic, you know, how do your legs feel? Uh, he doesn't ask a leper, how does your skin feel? He doesn't ask Peter's mother-in-law. How are you feeling? Is your fever gone? Jesus never asked anybody about a miracle that he performs except for right here. Do you see anything? And then the guy doesn't see clearly. Then the guy says, oh, well, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And so his vision is blurry, even though Jesus has touched him. And so then Jesus touches him a second time, and he sees clearly. But once he sees clearly, Jesus says, okay, don't even go back to the village. Go straight home. Don't go to the village. It's like, don't talk to anyone. And so we're just kind of left wondering, okay, what is this miracle all about? That it took Jesus two times touching him in order for him to see clearly. Now, some people might say that what we have going on here is that the guy didn't have enough faith. But I really doubt that's the case. Um, his friends brought him to Jesus, not hoping for blurry vision. His friends brought him to Jesus, anticipating that Jesus would be able to restore his sight and would indeed restore his sight. And so I don't think that there is, quote unquote, a faith issue in terms of they just didn't believe enough. So, so don't, don't go down that path. Uh, maybe, you know, you could go down this path, although I wouldn't. But this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus heals somebody who is blind. And you might say, well, you know, blind is a rather difficult one to heal. You know, casting out demons is one thing, but healing a blind person, that's another thing. Maybe Jesus is having a moment of self-doubt. Do you see anything? As if he's not sure if this one worked. Maybe the guy just has spit in his eyes and he didn't get the spit all the way. I don't know. Um, but we're left with questions here, and it's challenging to try to figure out what is going on in this miracle that Jesus asked the guy, do you see anything, that Jesus has to touch him a second time for him to see clearly, 
And that when Jesus sends him home, he says, don't go into the village. It's like, don't, don't let anybody know. Just go straight home and you're good. So what do we do with this? Well, I've learned across the years that one of the most important things to do when you don't understand a passage of scripture is to read context. So look at what's going on around it. And this is especially true for the Gospel of Mark. Well, really all the synoptic gospel, well, the, all of scripture, but we especially see it in the Gospel of Mark. So let's read a little bit before this passage. So I'm gonna back all the way up to verse 14 of chapter eight, okay? So this is the story, the episode before the blind man gets healed. So Mark chapter 8, 14. Now they'd forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus aware of this said to them, why are you disciples discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Now, question, who's blind? Yeah, the disciples are. The disciples just don't get it. They've seen Jesus do miracle after miracle, feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. And Jesus warns them about the yeast of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. And because they forgot to bring bread, they think that, well, maybe he's talking about bread and they're worried about having enough to eat. And so did you catch the question? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? The disciples are blind to who Jesus is. They still don't get it. Very next story, we have the healing of the blind man. Now, let's go over on the other side of that story to verse 27, very next episode. So we have the disciples that Jesus is asking, do you still not see anything yet? And then we have the healing of the blind man. And now, verse 27, chapter 8, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Okay, I hope some things are starting to click. That before the miracle of the healing of the blind man, the disciples are blind. Then you have the miracle of the blind man. Do you see anything? Do you see anything? And then you have the conversation with the disciples. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, for the first time, in the Gospel of Mark, says, you are the Christ. First time the disciples recognize who he is. You are the Christ. It's like Peter's eyes are open. He finally sees. And Jesus says, okay, don't tell anyone. Almost like saying to that blind man that he healed, okay, go straight home. Don't go back into the village. Peter, don't tell anyone. Now, it looks like everything's starting to make sense a little bit. Uh, the one question that we have is, okay, but why did it take Jesus two times to heal the blind man? If Peter sees, what's going on here that it took the blind man two touches to see? Okay, let's read a little bit further. So chapter 8 now, and on to verse 31. Peter said, you are the Christ. Jesus said, don't tell anyone. Verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Jesus said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Did you get that? Peter 
rebukes Jesus. Jesus starts to teach very plainly who, about his mission, that he is going to be handed over and he is going to be crucified and on the third day rise. And Peter says, no way are you going to be crucified. And so what we're seeing here is that Peter does not see clearly. He sees that Jesus is the Christ. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. Jesus starts to teach about his mission. Peter says, nope, that's not your mission. See, Peter has that old mission in mind to where it's the Messiah's job to reestablish David's throne, to renew the temple, and to bring judgment upon all those peoples that, are, that have oppressed the Jews. And Jesus said, no, I, I, that's not the kind of king I am. I am the servant king. I am the sacrifice. I am going to be handed over and offered up in Jerusalem. And Peter says, no. See, Peter does not see clearly. And so Jesus has to rebuke Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You're not looking at things from God's perspective. You're looking at things from a very human perspective. And then what we're also going to see is that Jesus goes on to teach the disciples about their cross. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So, Jesus begins to teach the cross, his cross and the cross of discipleship. Now I'm going to put this on pause and put a few diagrams up on the board and then come back and explain those. Okay, so hopefully you can see this okay. Uh, so here's what we just read kind of highlighted or diagrammed up here on the board. And so in 8, 14 to 21, we have this account of the disciples being blind. They still don't get who Jesus is. Jesus sounds a little bit frustrated with them. Do you still not see? Do you still not get it? Then we have the miracle of the blind man. And Jesus spits in his eyes, touches him first time, and has the question, do you see anything? What does the guy say? Uh, I see people, they're like trees walking around. And so we have blurry vision, does not see clearly. And then we have a second touch take place, and now he sees clearly. And then Jesus says, go home, uh, do not enter the village. So basically, don't, don't talk to anyone, don't tell anyone, just go straight home. Then we move to the next story, and it's this teaching time with the disciples. And Jesus has a question for them. And the question is, who do you say that I am? I hope you see the correlation in the questions. Uh, do you see anything? Who do you say that I am? So basically the same question. Disciples, do you see anything? Disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. He finally sees. And so now Jesus is ready to move on and begins to teach them about his cross. And what we discover is that Peter rebukes Jesus. And so Peter does not see clearly. So Peter is kind of right up here where he's had that first touch. He sees, but he doesn't see clearly. His vision is very blurry. And so Jesus has to rebuke Peter and tell him, get behind me, Satan. You're not looking at this. You're not seeing this from God's perspective. You're looking at this with a human mindset. And then Jesus goes on to teach the cross. Oh, and by the way, don't tell anyone. And we kind of see that down here in terms of don't enter the village. And so I hope you can see the correlation of the stories. Now, I said earlier that I don't think the problem was a lack of faith. Uh, maybe I need to elaborate on that a little bit more. 
it's not that the blind man lacked faith. What we're seeing here is that the disciples finally come to faith that Jesus is the Christ, but they don't get it. They don't have what? Faith that God's kingdom comes through Jesus going to the cross and that they participate in God's kingdom by taking up their own cross. And so maybe that's a faith issue. Maybe they had faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they don't have faith to believe in terms of how God's kingdom comes, that it comes through the cross of Christ, and it comes through their taking up their cross and following Christ. Well, let's go on. I want us to look at another blind man. And this is over in chapter 10. Okay, so flip a few pages over chapter 10. This is the second place in Mark where Jesus heals a blind man. In fact, this healing of blind men uh, kind of sandwiches, if you will, this section about discipleship and about the cross. And so Mark chapter 10, and we will pick it up at verse 46, the very last story in Mark 10. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take, your, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, this blind man has an advantage. Did you notice what this blind man called Jesus? Son of David. Son of David, have mercy on me. So this blind man already recognizes who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus says to him, has a question for him, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want to see. Now get this, immediately, Jesus, well, Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well, and he is able to get up, and he sees, and he follows Jesus on the way. Now, I haven't talked much about this, but where is Jesus going? He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die on the cross. When this man sees he gets up and he follows Jesus along the way. Now, what did Jesus say that disciples were to do? To take up their cross and to follow Jesus. And so this guy comes to complete sight to where he is following Jesus on the way to the cross. Okay, he already saw that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, son of David, have mercy on me. And now he comes to complete sight to where he follows Jesus on the way to the cross. Now, one more story, and then I'll put some more stuff up on the board. Uh, look with me at the story before this, a really interesting correlation. So Jesus has been teaching about his cross for the third time, and now we come to 1035. So if you go back to 1032, Jesus teaches his cross. It's the third time he teaches it, and then we get to verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What do you want me to do for you? By the way, that's the same question that Jesus said to the blind man in the story that's coming. Blind Mar Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Here Jesus says that to James and John. And so that question ties these two stories together. Not only are they side by side, but they're kind of interlaced together through that common question, what do you want me to do for you? James and John, like the blind man, know that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But now look at the difference. 
uh, they say, so I'm back to verse 36 here. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. See, they know he's the Messiah. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So these disciples, James and John, they still don't see clearly. They see that Jesus is a Christ. Do for us whatever we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? Well, when you come into your kingdom, in your glory, we want to sit at your right and your left. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? He's talking about his death. Can you drink from the cup, the cup of God's wrath, the cup of death that Jesus is going to drink from? Can you do that? They say, sure, we can. Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're talking about, but the day will come when you will. And then he goes on to teach about greatness in the kingdom, that it's about servanthood. And that Jesus came himself not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. So these disciples, James and John, they see, like Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, but also like Peter, they do not see that his kingdom comes through the cross and that to participate in his kingdom, they must take up their cross. And then we get that blind man, blind Bartimaeus, who sees that Jesus is the Christ. He wants to see. Jesus says, your faith has healed you and then made you well, saved you. And what does he do? He follows Jesus along the way on the cross. Okay, let me uh, pause this. I want to put a few more things up on the board, and then we'll come back and talk. Okay, so trying to get all this stuff up here on the board so you can kind of see everything together. Now, down here at the very end of the board, we have that last story we looked at in terms of blind Bartimaeus. And so, son of David, you know, have mercy upon me. What does blind Bartimaeus see? He sees that Jesus is the son of David, uh, just like Peter back here. Uh, you are the Christ. So blind Bartimaeus is seeing what Peter sees. You are the Christ, son of David. Is what James and John saw in terms of they want to sit at Jesus' right hand and his left when he comes into his kingdom. So all these blind see that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the one that's bringing God's kingdom. Now, the question that tied these two stories together, what do you want me to do for you? So blind Bartimaeus cries out, son of David, have mercy upon me. What do you want me to do for you? James and John, uh, teacher, do for us whatever, you, whatever we request. What do you want me to do for you? We want power seats, right and left. Bartimaeus, he just wants to see. And Jesus tells him that your faith has saved you. And what happens? He follows Jesus along the way. He gets up. He runs to Jesus, leaving his cloak aside. And Jesus heals him. And he follows Jesus along the way to the cross. What about uh, James and John? Well, Jesus says eventually you'll follow. But right now, they're clueless. And he gives them a lesson on servanthood. And that if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be least and you have to humble yourself and you have to serve just as Jesus came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this frames this whole middle section on discipleship and how the kingdom of God comes through the cross. That Jesus brings it through his cross and the disciples participate in it through taking up their cross and following 
And that is very challenging. Okay, that is, that is difficult. And in fact, the way I'm beginning to see this, no pun intended, but the way I'm beginning to see this is that discipleship is a miracle. So just as it was a miracle for this first blind man to see, and it took a second touch for him to see clearly, just as it's a miracle for blind Bartimaeus to see and to follow, so it's also a miracle for James and John and for Peter to see if they're ever going to see clearly and really get it that Jesus is the Christ and he brings his kingdom through the cross and they participate in his kingdom through taking up their own cross. See, it takes a miracle to get there. We don't just decide that on our own, that just as it's a miracle for blind Bartimaeus and or blind Bartimaeus over here, just as that's a miracle for them to see, it's a miracle for disciples to see. And these stories of the blind being healed, they're actually stories of hope. You know, will Peter ever get it? Will James and John ever get it? Well, the answer is yes, they will get it. Why? Because Jesus will not leave them seeing blurry. That Jesus will, quote unquote, touch them a second time that Jesus will keep working with them and bringing them to a place where they actually see and follow all the way to the cross. Peter is going to eventually be a martyr. We talked about that. Uh, James, he is going to be martyred. And then John, he will live to a ripe old age, but he will be a faithful witness. Okay, so there's one more story I want us to look at that's right in the middle of this section. And it's back to chapter 9. So back to chapter 9. And I'm going to start it at, uh, well, let me go ahead and erase the board. And then we'll get into this. In fact, before I erase it, if you want to, you're welcome to take a screenshot of it. I'll get out of the way. And you can take a screenshot of it. It'd be good to be able to kind of see these connections, explain how these connections work in terms of reading the Gospel of Mark. All right, trust you've had a good screenshot. Okay, we're ready to continue on. Mark chapter 9 and verse 2. So we're going to look at 2 to 13, and then we're going to look at 14 to 32. And this is kind of at the heart of this section on discipleship, this section on how the kingdom comes. So 9-2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the characters here. So who shows up? Jesus is transfigured before them. He's in his glory. He is glistening bright. And there is Elijah. Okay, why is Elijah there? Some would say that Elijah is symbolic of the prophets. And so with Elijah and Moses, you have the law and the prophets testifying to who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Elijah and Moses representing the prophets and the law there to testify on Jesus' behalf. Okay, that's, that's one angle on it. A second angle is that these two are what's referred to as eschatological figures. Okay, in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy in Malachi that Elijah will come first and prepare the way for the Messiah. So Elijah prepares, 
prepares the way. And so that's what he's doing there. It's kind of like he is saying, okay, I'm here, I'm preparing the way, and that Jesus is the one that I'm preparing for. Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy that there will be a prophet like me that the Lord will raise up from among you. Listen to him. And so here would be Elijah and Moses kind of testifying that, hey, Jesus is the one that we talked about. Jesus is the one that I'm to prepare the way for. Moses, Jesus is the prophet who's like me, that God will raise up, listen to him. And then we get the voice from heaven. This is my son whom I love, listen to him. Same voice at the baptism when Jesus came up out of the water, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Almost the same line, this is my son. Okay, speaking to who? Peter, James, and John, the disciples. This is my son whom I love. And we talked about this. This is my son refers to the role of king. So you got it right. He's the Messiah king whom I love. Sacrifice. Okay, and so notice, listen to him. In our context, what are they not listening to? They're not listening to Jesus teaching that he will go to the cross, that his kingdom comes through the cross. And so Jesus' identity as Messiah is being confirmed. And Peter, James, and John get this confirmation. They need to listen to him. What's Jesus trying to teach them? He's trying to teach them how his kingdom comes. It comes through his cross. And this is where they struggle. This is what they don't want to hear. But the word is, listen to him. Okay, then we go to the next story. Continuing in chapter 9, and it's verses 14 through 32. So let me go ahead and read this. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with him? And someone from the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Now i got to pause there for a moment. It's really interesting that Jesus calls them a faithless generation. And it's like, how long do I got to put up with you? Now, they brought, the, the dad brought his son to the disciples in faith, believing that they could do something. And they weren't able to. And then Jesus chastises them and the father too about the lack of faith. Puzzle. Verse 20. Uh, and he answered them, O oh, or 19, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, these unclean spirits that we meet in Mark, um, they're always trying to defile the person, always trying to destroy the person. And so this has been going on since childhood. And it really is kind of an existential question. How long has he been like this? How long have we been like we are? How long has the human race been defiled like it is? I mean, the boy is barely recognizable as being human. He's foaming at the mouth. Verse 23, uh, or, or the dad said at the end of verse 22, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. 
But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And then they get into an argument about who's the greatest. Okay, I hope you're starting to see connections even before I mention. So the boy has an unclean spirit, right? And the father says, if you can do anything, have mercy upon us, compassion upon us, help us. Jesus says, all things are possible to him who believes. And what does dad say? I believe, help my unbelief. Now, if we just had this story by itself, we would think that dad is just asking Jesus, give me more faith. You know, help me to ramp my faith up enough so that I have enough faith so that we'll receive this miracle from you. Okay, but we're reading this in context. And what we're seeing is that this is really what all the disciples need to be praying. I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ. Help my unbelief when it comes to the cross. See, that's right where we're at all across this section. You know, I erased it already, but you got it in your mind. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. Jesus begins to teach Peter about the cross. Peter rebukes Jesus. Not going to happen that way. He believes, but his unbelief is at the point of the cross and how the kingdom comes. James and John, with their request about sitting at Jesus' right hand and left, they believe that he's the Christ. They're stuck, though, in unbelief, not seeing clearly that that means that they need to embrace the cross themselves. But Jesus heals the blind, and he doesn't leave them with blurry vision. He brings them to a place where, like blind Bartimaeus way down there, follow Jesus along the way to the cross. And so this prayer of dad, I believe, helped my unbelief. That's really the prayer of all the disciples who recognize that Jesus is the Christ, but they're struggling with the call of the cross. With Jesus going to the cross or with the call for them to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow. I believe, help my unbelief. I just don't see how the cross is the way that your kingdom comes. Jesus heals the boy. And how does the boy look? Dead. But then Jesus takes him by the hand and lifts him up. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. You're going to look dead. You're going to be dead in a certain sense. But then you receive life and you participate in the coming of God's kingdom. So this is the kind of the, the big section. Oh, and I know somebody's thinking, well, what does it mean when Jesus says this kind can come out only by prayer? Well, when you look in the Gospel of Mark and you read through it, when Jesus is at prayer, most intense prayer, it's always about how the kingdom comes through the cross, whether it's in his temptations, whether it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus is wrestling in prayer, it's about his cross, that it's through prayer that you come to the place where you embrace the cross and you say, not my will, but your will be done. And you accept the cross as the way that the kingdom of God comes. And by the way, that Roman centurion, he sees how Jesus died and he confesses, surely this was the son of God. That when Jesus dies, that's when the centurion recognizes, wow, he was a son of God and the kingdom comes. Well, there is so much more that we could do with the gospel of Mark. It would be fun to have a whole semester just on Mark. In fact, you can sign up for an upper division class and focus on the Gospel of Mark. But we're going to have to move on to, to Matthew here. But I do want you to remember the context, right? The context, the occasion and purpose. Uh, Mark is writing for the church at Rome in a situation of intense persecution. And I hope you can see how this section right at the core 
would be so important for them to grasp that they're probably wrestling with, Jesus, you're, you're the Christ. Why are we suffering so much? And not being able to see that, it's, that God's actually at work in it, bringing about his kingdom, that we uh, participate in the kingdom through denying ourselves, through taking up our cross, and through following, that that's the way the kingdom comes, that's the way we participate in it, and so as they were facing this, this was the exact news that they needed to hear, and maybe it's what we need to hear as well, that it's not enough simply to say, Jesus, you're the Christ. We need to listen to him about how his kingdom comes and how we actually participate in it is through denying ourselves, is through putting him first, is through taking up our cross and following him. All right, well, I'm going to start preaching if I stay on too long. So let me end this, and we will be shifting our focus to the gospel of Matthew in the next lecture.